Yeah, I think working with a behavioral specialist is is key. If you are someone who has, um, you know, deep rooted issues around your relationship with food, um, around you know your coping mechanisms, um, something that's underappreciated as a source for overeating and obesity is actually childhood trauma. Um, I just diagnosed a patient earlier today, actually, with with um, really serious childhood trauma. And I don't think anyone had ever talked to her and she had never opened up about it. So it was a big deal. And, um, you know, I just listened and we had a conversation and I tried to be non-judgmental. And, you know, it was very clear to me after even just a few minutes of talking that that played a significant role in her adult weight issues was uh, the trauma around that. Things I commonly see that I really feel bad about is many adults now when they were kids, it was sort of thought to be okay. When you're like 12, your mom like drug you to Weight Watchers or like uh, put you on these like insane restrictive diets. And so I have all of these, particularly women I see, because I see a lot, you know, my practice is predominantly women, also my TikTok following too, because women typically um, are better patients and are more likely to seek healthcare. That's kind of, ob that's, that's very well known among sort of healthcare statistics. But of the women that I see, uh, some of them, you know, have this a lot of psychological trauma from when their their parents sort of made them go on these very insane diets way back in the day. So it's really sad because then I talk to them and you can hear how their relationship with food has just totally been altered their whole lives because of this. So, you know, I think having a conversation about that, getting to the root of the matter, uh, TikTok, uh, TikTok Rickster, um, I think is super important. You have to address those aspects of behavior. Absolutely. So I've seen this, like I had like for a week, I had like, like these adult women just come in and be like, Oh my, the, the horror stories of what they were put through as adolescent. I was like, no wonder you have a hard, you have uh, eating problems or you have an eating disorder now, or you've had an eating disorder. It's like you, that eating disorder was, forced upon you by your mother or your father or whoever adult authority in your life was when you were an adolescent. And I was like, it's horrible. It's tragic. Kids should not be taken through these really restrictive diets and told and conditioned to fear food and to hate themselves. I mean, it, golly, when we talk about helping kids manage their weight, a lot of it has to do with actually educating the parents and, and changing the home environment. It act, has very little to do with the kids. The only times we really um, intervene with the kids is if it's very progressive or there is there are genetic components, right? So there are certain genetic mutations that can cause obesity in, in the pediatric population. There are certain uh, syndromic cases of obesity. So in those cases, like uh, we will intervene or in the extreme sort of health circumstances. But otherwise, a lot of it, the first, second, and third line, if you look at the guidelines around managing pediatric obesity, it's talking to the family. It's about optimizing the home environment, educating the family. How do we support the kids um, in, in uh, their health pursuit? So it has very little to do. I mean, framing it as the kid's fault is, is wrong. Uh, by most standards. Um, it's no one's fault, really, ever, if they struggle with weight. I shouldn't say that. Yeah, you know, that's really interesting. So there is some data. I don't know that we are 100% sold on it, but Kevin Hall's group, they looked at the biggest loser, and they took um, a number of participants that had been in the been a part of the biggest loser contest on TV. You know, I think it was previously on ABC or something, very popular show back in the day. And then they, they looked at them and kind of did a baseline assessment before they lost all the weight and then afterwards. And they looked at them like six years later. And what is remarkable is that six years later, a lot of them had lower than what would be expected metabolisms for their body weight. And many of them had gained back a, a certain amount of weight um, because they had such drastic weights early, weight loss early on with the show. Um, but even after, after they gained the weight back, their metabolism are still slower than what was expected. And so there has been subsequent studies that have sort of looked at this concept. Like if you lose weight, does your metabolism like permanently slow? Um, what happens around that? And I would say the evidence we have, 
uh, is less convincing that that's a permanent thing across like all people that diet or that try to lose weight? Um, does it happen in a segment of the population? Possibly, you know, that, that there is a really pronounced metabolism slowing that's more so than we would even expect. But when you look at weight loss, and they've now done modeling on this, uh, for every kilogram of weight you lose, your metabolism slows about 20 calories a day. So there is a natural slowing of weight loss, uh, natural slowing of metabolism with weight loss, but is it extreme to the extent that we saw in The Biggest Loser across everybody? Probably not. I, I don't think the evidence, the rest of the evidence that has come out since then certainly doesn't suggest it. So I think that was a little hyped up and probably, and that's also why we don't just study 12 people and, and call it a day and say, hey, we, we understand the concept. No, we have to look at many more people because a small group can be incredibly misleading and you may just capture, uh, you know, outliers from the, from the community. And so that can be very deceptive in interpreting sort of the results. And that's why we do things like meta-analyses where we aggregate the results of a bunch of studies. Like I posted that meta-analysis on the benefits of bariatric surgery, bariatric surgery consistently. Um, and there were 180, I mean, evaluated 180 participants, 180,000 participants, bariatric surgery consistently, um, uh, increase the life expectancy of people that got it versus people that didn't get it who qualified, you know, so they had what is called matched controls, uh, which means these are people that had very similar health statistics as the people that pursued bariatric surgery and, um, and they didn't get it. So they could serve as a control for the group that got bariatric, sur bariatric surgery and the bariatric surgery group um, lived on average five to nine years longer, which is pretty incredible. Um, so yeah, it shows you the benefits, that it's a really effective treatment for people that need it. Um, and the group they looked at were people that had what they considered severe obesity. Usually that's referred to as a BMI greater than 40 for anybody that's unclear on that terminology. As you age, it becomes easier to gain fat um, relative to muscle, preserving muscle and bone, which is your what we consider your fat-free mass. So it's easier to gain fat it's easier to lose muscle and bone and that creates quite the predicament right because it means that we get more frail but we don't necessarily get thinner or we don't necessarily become uh lighter we actually can gain more weight but it's the wrong kind of weight too it's not it's not the lean tissues that we really um, like because those are important for longevity and health and so um, that becomes difficult. One of the big things that I harp on for people as they age, um, as part of the holistic approach in addressing your weight, is um, resistance training. I think not enough people are willing to do even the basic things like body weight exercises, like push ups, sit ups, um, pull ups, um, squats, lunges, those sorts of things. Not enough people do them. And it's so important to preserve your strength to provide you with that energy boost, um, to complement what you're doing from a dietary standpoint. So I think that's super, super helpful. It also becomes increasingly helpful um, as you get older and your metabolism slows down to keep your metabolism revved up so that doesn't become another issue that you have to worry about. And resistance training, which provides what we call an anabolic stimulus, which just means it helps your body grow. Well, when we talk about growing, we're talking about bone and muscle. Um, it's really the only way we can preserve our muscle is, is by, by forcing our muscle to work. And so a lot of people have an aversion to doing any type of resistance training, even body weights, or even with simple dumbbells. And I will be honest, it's like one of the biggest things I emphasize for people as they get older, got to do them because frailty and a condition called sarcopenic obesity, which is like a frail obesity state is one of the leading causes of disease and morbidity in the aging population in the US. And so the sad thing is people can't move because they get they get excessively large and they can't move because they don't have the muscles to move their excessively large bodies. And so it's a double hit. It's not just that you lose muscle, it's that you also have this extra weight and you just can't, your bodies can't move. And then if you don't move, we know as people start to slow down, their health worsens. And so um, it's, it's something I am, I can't emphasize enough. 
I don't even like to say to be obese. I like to say to have obesity. So I think that's that's a good place to start. I really encourage people to use first and per, first person first language, um, saying things like the person with obesity, not the obese person. And why is that? It's a subtlety, but I think it's an important subtlety, right? Because obesity does not define that individual. They are they are not the obese person. They are a person with obesity with diabetes, with hypertension. We don't say the cancer person. We don't say the hypertensive person. Um, sometimes people see, say the diabetic man or woman, they shouldn't, they should say the, per, the man or woman with diabetes. Because once again, your disease, whether or not you were unlucky to struggle with your weight does not define you. You are separate from your disease, your individuality, your self-worth is separate. And, and so I think that's an important Important thing to talk about. Um, getting back to your question about other people, how do we deal with the fat shaming, the stigma around obesity? I think we start to have conversations, and that's the whole motivation of why I'm on this platform. I think we start to have conversations. We educate people who are ignorant. We talk about the privilege of being able to wake up every day and not have to struggle with your weight. Um, and I know many of you people probably for a large percentage of your life, that wasn't the case, right? That you, it, you've it you been managing your weight for many, many years. And so and many people who tend to stigmatize others operate from an area of, in a place of tremendous privilege. The only way we can get them to understand their privilege is to start to talk about it, to start having real conversations, to start showing the science and what the science supports. And I think only then, and it's not going to happen overnight, frankly, only then will we start to really make progress on this front. So yeah, and it's not an easy problem to solve. It's a huge uphill battle, but I think we all have to do our part. And so, you know, this is in many ways my contribution in, on that front. And I, I go around all of California. I give lectures. Um, I get invited to go give talks across the country. Um, and And so... You know, that's how I do my part is try to educate other doctors, providers, patients, etc. And um, I think that's how we start. We have a discussion.